Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe another time. All right. 30-day challenge. Week one was prayer. Come on. Week one was prayer. Connecting with God. Right? Week two, we did fasting. Committing to God. Did anybody notice how week one prayer made its way into fasting week two? Amen. There's two or three you, you're getting, right? There's a maturity that grows that you understand that on week two, we, we needed prayer to get through fasting. See, these disciplines build on each other. So tell somebody, I'm growing. I'm learning something. I might be a Christian 80 years, but I'm learning something even in this time. Amen. So, so they make their ways into each other. So, so week three, this is week three, is study. And, and so we've, we've committed, we've committed to God. We've connected with God. And now it's about consuming God. It's about consuming the word. It's about, about studying. And the, the challenge this week, listen to it right now, the challenge this week is to read the entire book of John. For some of you, you've read through the Bible a bunch of times. For some of you, this might be the first book you're actually going to read the whole book. Come on. Don't be embarrassed. Amen. If you're reading Challenged, the Version Bible online for free, you could download it to your app, you could download it to anything, it'll read the word to you. So you are not exempt Amen? You say, well, I never knew how to read. Well, you knew how to, you knew how to listen, though, right? So, so you turn to the Bible and you press play. And on the bus or in the train or on your way in, however, you listen to the book of John this week. The challenge is to get the entire book of John inside. Amen? Everybody up for the challenge? Amen. All right. You already heard from Mark. We canceled Wednesday. I know we've been coming out. We've been running. We've been going through so much. And then the weather's been hard. I, just, I thank you guys for coming out and being a part. I'm, I'm honored and humbled, man, that we would be here in this mess and that you would be here to get something. And I don't want to disappoint. I want to make sure you get what you came for. Amen. So we're, we're preparing church using these three disciplines, prayer, fasting, and study. Week four is going to be all about service. And so week four starts this Saturday, right? And this Saturday, man, we got projects lined up. We got new lights we're going to put up. We're going to paint some walls. We're going to touch up some things. We're going to clean some things, scrub some things, dust some things, change some things, move some things. Amen? We got an endless supply. So whether two of you show up or 200, there's an endless supply of things to do that we're going to try to accomplish in, in one day. Just to get this place ready so that we can invite more people. Amen? Because it's not, and, and listen, it's not about growing big, big. It's about doing what God called us to do. And that's what God called us to do is to reach people. Amen? All right? So, so remember, the goal of this 30-day challenge is to live a life of purpose on purpose. To live a life that shines with the will and the purposes of God. I don't want, I, I don't like people that just call themselves Christians. Do you know that one half of America says that they're Christians? One half is one of the statistics I read. 50% of people in the world of, in America say that they're Christians. But 50% of the of, of, don't live, they live just like the other 50. Right? A amen? Can we talk this morning? They live the same. So that's not what I want, man. I want a church of rounded and grounded, ground and pound Christians. Amen? That have good habits of reading, reflecting, revealing God in everyday life. All right? Okay, so this past week, fasting, how did it go? You, come on. That was the typical Christian answer. Awesome, everything was great, praise the Lord. Come on, some of you should have said, that sucked. <laughs> That's all good, right? You would have been honest. Hated it. Anybody, can, can I get the real answers now? Hated it. Hate you for it. <laughs> Never do that again. Come on. I want my Facebook back. Listen, it's not supposed to be easy. That's why we call it a challenge. Amen? That's why it's a challenge. That's why and the challenge requires commitment. And character is forged in the fire of commitment. Oh, man. If you was on social media, you'd be tweeting that stuff right now. 
Listen, if you're not being challenged, it's probably because you're not committing. I hear people say, oh, I'm not challenged. Then, then commit to something. Watch how quickly you feel the challenge. Commit to something and watch how big a challenge it gets. Amen? I know, listen, for some of you, letting go of food was easier than letting go of your social networks. Right? Eat, you say, I give up a pork chop any day, give me my Instagram. I know. But listen, what did it teach you? Did it, did it teach you that we spend way too many hours? Did, did anybody get that revelation this week? Did anybody say, oh my God, how many hours of the day do I spend checking my status and other people's status and looking at people's duck lips and looking at people's food and looking at people? Like, how many hours of my life is consumed by this? So, so did you find a little more time on your hands? Did you, did you make better use of that time this week? Yeah, amen, amen. Amen. That's good stuff. We're ahead of the game. <clears throat> Did any of you give that time back to God? A little bit. Not all of it. A little bit. A little bit. Wouldn't it be crazy that if all the time that we gave to Facebook, we give to God, people would say we're like, we're fanatics? Can you think about that for a minute? If we spent all the time that we spent on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and committed that to God during the week, People will say, oh, come on, bro, you're a little, chill out. You're like a fanatic, bro, take it easy, all right? You're a little weird. But it's totally fine giving it to our social networks, right? Isn't that crazy, guys? Let me ask you this. Today is lifted. Amen. Praise God. Come on. But do you want to lock yourself back in full time, committed, locked like that again? into that bondage of time. I, I hope not. Into the bondage of the online status. Or, or this week, will we practice kind of being a little more conscious? Can we practice kind of going in easy and practice knowing when to let go? Somebody say amen. amen. When you're with the family, keep the phone in the pocket maybe. Maybe. Right? When you're in a conversation with somebody, can we have a conversation where we're looking at each other instead of looking at the glare of the light on our faces? Maybe a little bit, amen? Maybe when you're in bed with your spouse, can you not worry about your status? Because if you are, there's a problem. <laughs> Maybe when we're at a restaurant, can we keep the phones away? Make that a rule. Keep the phone. First person to check the phone has to pay the bill. That's a good game. It never works for me, though. Nobody wants to pay the bill. I don't, I don't understand. Listen, church, and I'm not telling you social media is evil. I'm not saying social media is of the devil. You should be. No, it, there's some darkness on there, but we're light, and we're supposed to be in the darkness. Amen? Light is supposed to shine in the darkness. So I do believe that we, are, are, we should be in there. We should be all up in Instagram and Twitter. We should be in there, but, but it's a matter of kind of understanding and knowing our role. Amen? So, so I, on, on that point, I'll tell you, listen, have fun. Enjoy social media. If you like the purple lipstick and you think it looks great, take 46 duck lip pictures. I don't care. Post them all you want. But listen, if you like it, like it. Don't care about who else likes it. Amen? Amen? Can we say it, right? If you like it, man, like it. Don't live for man's statuses. Let's live for God's statuses. Amen? So, so, and God doesn't care if you got purple lipstick or not. So, hey, he's like, yeah, you like that, baby? That's beautiful. I gave you those big lips for a reason. <laughs> but let's be consistent. Can we, can we, going into social media now, can we be a little more consistent? What do I mean by that? I got to take my sword off for that one. What do I mean by consistent? Can we not, Isaiah 43 this week, and then tomorrow, F-bomb this guy and F-bomb that guy. And if she don't like it, she can kiss my, and this one, this. Oh, but the Lord is good, and the Lord supplies, and the Lord is so. Oh, and Psalm 26. Oh, and Psalm 63. Oh, and Isaiah this. Oh, but F that guy. Oh, if this guy, this guy, this one thinks that she's a, and she's a, and come on. Can we be consistent? Amen. 
This stuff is not necessary. If you got a problem with somebody, men and women of God, we don't post it. We confront it. We go to it. Amen? So that we can be, all right, en- enough about that. All right. So be consistent. Love it. Okay. So by now, how many of you have your one word for the year? Come on. One word. Raise your hand if you're sure. In this church, we're not, we don't believe in resolutions. We ask God a God word for, for the year. And we ask God to, to use that word to shape us all throughout the year. Amen? So listen, if you don't have your one word yet, get to us. What, what, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? Maybe your word should be the opposite of procrastinate. Maybe your word should mean something that doesn't mean put it off till later. Do it tomorrow. Can I tell you, yeah, maybe your word is now. Somebody said it. Your word is now. Your word is, listen, if you're spelling challenged, let me give you a simple word. Your word is do. <laughs> D-O. Tell somebody to write it for you on your test. Do. That's your word. Do. Do. Your word might be action. Your word might be anticipate. Your word might be prepare. Your word might be diligent. Right? But get with the challenge already, dot com. Amen? Listen, I've heard some incredible words from you guys so far. I was speaking to a brother, and he was telling me everything he's gone through this past year, and his word for the year is restore. And oh, when he said that word, I felt it in my spirit. I said, that's good. That's a God word. That's what God's going to do in your life, man. And I'm believing that will trickle on to the people that are around you. Somebody else needs that word, restore, restoration. Is your word. I, I was speaking to somebody else and somebody else told me, man, you know, there's a lot of character traits and things that we have that we don't like to deal with. And we're always putting it off and putting it off. This year, his word is vulnerability. So he's going to be vulnerable this year because we need to deal with some of those things, man. Somebody else told me, you know what? I'm changing everything this year. My word is change. I want everything changed. I want to change everything. I want to change. Uh, that, that, that's, some, that's some of your word if you're still missing a word. Amen? So, okay, so we have our word. Let's assume, you know, once the, you late guys catch on today after service, you, you're all going to have our word. So what do we do with the word now? How can we have this one word shape our entire year? How can I put this word to work? Is that what you're asking? Good, good, good question. Good question. Give yourselves a hand. Good questions. So here's what we do. I want to answer that question. So what we do now, we take this word and we research the heck out of it. I mean, look for it everywhere. Look at it in the dictionary, in the encyclopedia, in the thesaurus, in in any book that you have, any online search engine. Google that word. Unless it could give you some dirty results, then don't don't do that. But most most of your words shouldn't. But anyway. Search for that word. Then here's the power. Find that word in Scripture. Here's the power. Now listen, some of your words might be a little too modern, and they might not fit the exact word, but find a synonym, a word that means the same, a word that's like that word, and find that word in Scripture. You you follow me? Search it. Listen, the more you know, the more this word will grow. And the more it'll change you. Let me give you an example. Let me tell you what happened for me this week. My word I told you last week is clarity. Clarity. I'm on, I want clearness and understanding. And so I, I shared last week I was focused on being, I want to be clear about my prayers. I want to be clear the way I pray. I want to be clear what God wants from me. I want, I want God's directions to be clear. I want to be clear about my expectations. I, I want, you know, I want instruction. I want wisdom. I want God to, to just make things clear for me. Anybody? Amen? So, so that was my, you know, my, my expectation with this word clear. Another thing about me, and this is my heart, I want to help make things clear for people. That's, that's me. That's what I want, right? I want to make things clear for people. I, wanna, I don't like seeing people confused or doubt or fear or, or, or stuff. I want to make things clear for you. I wish that I could just say a word to everybody, just kind of make things clear, amen? I want to bring clarity to people's lives. So when I looked into the definition deeper this week, Clarity, you know how sometimes you're, you're in a dictionary, it'll give you one definition, then another definition as a noun, or another definition as a verb, or another definition. Some words have a lot of definitions. 
I found another definition for clarity, which means the state of being see-through. The state of being transparent. So I said, God, you're setting me up with that one. I didn't see that coming. That's not, that's not why I chose. That's why you know it's a God word. When God will unfold that word and it will mean something else, you'll be like, oh, man. That's not the area I wanted to deal with this year. So, so see, because listen, for me, church, personally, some of you know it's easy when you've been in ministry for a long time. When, even when you've just been in church life for a long time, it's easy to become guarded. It's easy to put up walls. It's easy to, to put up, uh, you know, to, to become protected, to become kind of shielded. You know, I, the, the mentors I had growing up in, 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 in my Christian walk, they told me clearly, they listen, don't even, don't make friends. Listen to this. Don't make friends with the people in the church that you're pastoring. That was the advice I got early, you know, early ministry. Because those, and, and at that point, it seemed crazy to me. I said, how, that makes no sense. Come on. How, how are we going to be together? How are we going to be community if we, if we don't make friends? But, but I have to be honest with you. After 20-something years of ministry, I understand what they're saying. Because, see, the closer you let people in, the, the easier it is for them to hurt you. And the more it hurts when they pull away, and the more it hurts when they, when they rip apart, or the more they, you, you understand? So I kind of understand the, the, I don't agree with it, but I, I understand where they were coming from. And so, but, but, so I see with this word that God is calling me to remain transparent. God is telling me, you stay unguarded, stay uncovered. You don't have to guard yourself, God says, because I'm a shield around you. You don't have to be protected because no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So remain transparent, and this I heard this clear, remain transparent so that people could see through you and see me. Wow. That's my prayer. Even right now, let's just pray and start this all over again. Father, I just pray that, that every teacher, every leader, every, every Christian, every believer in this church, God, that we would allow ourselves to become transparent. That we would allow ourselves to be see-through. Even if it's not here, but God, when we leave this place, when we're at our jobs, when we're at our schools, when we're in our communities, that we would be see-through, God, so that people would see through us and see you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So you can see how one word can affect you and keep affecting you and keep changing you. Amen? That's how this one word thing works. You research, you pray, you read the scriptures, you search them for your word. Listen, this week I did a quick search for my word in a couple of Bible versions online. You don't have to have this entire library at home online. You have every free Bible, every free version you can, you can think about. BibleGateway.com, StudyLight.org. All these, all these online Bibles that are free. So I did a quick search for my word, and the word clarity doesn't come up, but a root word of it, clarify, does. And so I found clarify, and, and it only showed up in, in two different places. And I said, man, maybe, maybe this is not that great a word. This only shows up twice in the whole of Scripture. I looked up the first one. It was found in Job 4, 3. And I was, I, at this point in the week, it was a lot, a lot of things going on. I was, I was feeling a little discouraged, kind of. And, and I'm, I'm just looking at the Word. I'm trying to, you know, stay on challenge and stay in challenge. And I, I go to Job 4.3, and this is Job's friend talking about Job, but I was just reading this as, this is where God led me. This is God talking to me. And it says, you yourself have done this plenty of times. You've spoken words that clarify. You've encouraged those who were about to quit. Your words have put stumbling people on their feet, and you've put fresh hope in people about to collapse. And I said, wow, God, thank you. I felt like that was for me. You know, you guys can't have that one. That was for me. <laughs> Amen? Get your own. Don't be selfish. You want everything. Get your own. That one was for me, right? I was looking for, <coughs> for, for clarity 
For, and so that clarify came up. And so the only, the only other time that it appears in all of Scripture, I'm searching Old Testament, New Testament. I'm searching this one site has about 15 different versions from the King James all the way to the message. So it's like from the oldest language to the newest, right? Two times only. You know, the second time, the second place that it appears in all of Scripture, it appears in the book of Daniel. During the week that we're fasting, during the week that we started talking and teaching on Daniel, because a lot of us are doing the Daniel fast, do you think that's a coincidence? Or do you think God is involved all up and through this thing? Amen? So it took us to the book of Daniel, where, where we shared Last week, and last week we shared about how Daniel set himself up apart from the others that were, you know, taken captive and forced into training by, by the king. And so he set himself apart by fasting. And the word says that God honored his commitment before the king. And, and it, God gave him clarity of mind and of spirit. And it said God gave Daniel wisdom and insight to bring clarity to others. In Daniel 5, and this is where we'll be for, for, for the rest of the moments that we have together today. In Daniel 5, I love the way the queen describes Daniel. Well, watch this. Daniel 5, verse 11. She says, there's a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit, she's talking to the king. There's a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods and in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. She was talking about Daniel. She said, in Daniel, there's, there's an excellent spirit. There's a, a knowledge and an understanding. There's an interpreting of dreams and a showing of dark riddles and a dissolving of doubts are found in this man, Daniel. Another version says, he's able to clarify riddles and solve problems. So she's saying this to the grandson, and why is she saying this to the grandson because this grandson is running things now because of a horrible vision that he just had. So he's the king now, and he has, he's the second in command. And he has this terrifying vision. I want you to, to go there if, you, if you're looking at Daniel chapter 5. Let me give you a little story here what's happening. At this point in history, Belshazzar, he was second in charge there in Babylon. And we learn from historical references and, and from other points of Scripture that at this point, the, the first king, he was out battling the enemy armies who were attempting to take over Babylon. So Belshazzar is left. He's the second in charge. So the army is out trying to hold back this attack. But we learn later on that even at this very hour, the enemy is surrounding all of Babylon, trying to find a way in to take the city. But this guy's young. He's arrogant. He's confident. He doesn't care. Belshazzar doesn't care. He thinks his kingdom is so safe and so secure because understand, Babylon was heavily fortified. Listen, the outer walls were 17 miles long. The outer walls were 22 feet thick and 90 feet high. So can you imagine being surrounded by walls, your city, that are 22 feet thick and 90 feet high? And they had guard towers that were another hundred feet higher. And then these city gates, the gates to the city, they were made of bronze. There was a system of inner and outer walls. And then there were moats. Oh, that's, you know, where they dig out and they fill with water. And usually, you know, crocodiles or whatever it is, you know, they, they fill the entire place with water. So you can't, so you got to cross the water to get to the wall. The wall is 90 feet. It's 22 feet thick, so you can't blast through it, Right? So this guy's feeling pretty confident. He ain't worried about nothing. Amen? And so he, what, this is what Belshazzar does at this time. He throws this tremendous party. I mean, like a turn. We, we, some of us thought we turned it up at a wedding last night. Belshazzar throws a party for a thousand of his nobles. A thousand, the word says. And he had his concubines and his wives, and they were getting all the way turned up. And so in this, in this moment, he decides it would be cool. Listen, watch this. He decides it would be cool if we took the goblets. You know, how many of you have been to Catholic churches, and you know where they serve the, 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 the you know, those gold chalices, that, that kind of, right? That came from, from Israel's type of, of, 
of, of scene and the way they did things. And those, those gold goblets, they were only used by the priests. They were only used in service to God. And they were in, extremely sacred to God's people, right? And so, but, but they, they had captured Jerusalem some time before. And so the king Nebuchadnezzar, before that, he had all that stuff stored. So Belshazzar, he thinks it would be so cool if he took those goblets and drunk wine with them. How many of you know that's trouble? He, he thought it would be so cool. He said, you know what would be so wicked cool? I picture him like, like a real like, Caucasian dude. Yo, this would be like so wicked cool. <laughs> this would be like so awesome, man. Let's take all of, and, and let's take, and then let's use them. Let's use them to drink out of, to get lifted with. But let's use the gold goblets that belong to the God of Israel. And so they start drinking wine out of these goblets. And, and because they're made out of gold and silver, they start worshiping the gods of gold and silver and of bronze and iron and stone and wood. In other words, they're worshiping every other god using God's glasses. How, how many of you know something's happening right now? This is Old Testament. This is before grace. <laughs> this is Old Testament times, right? And so they're using God's glasses to toast every other God imaginable. Suddenly, look at chapter 5, verse 5. It says, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and started writing on the plaster wall. Show me that picture. It started writing on the plaster wall near the lampstand in the royal place, palace. This is, somebody there had a, had a cell phone and so they took a picture this is, this is what it was. You know, back then they were like Nokia's, you know, so it wasn't good quality, but, but this, is, this is what it looked like. He's partying, man. Every, he has his wives, his concubines, his thousand noblemen, and they're using God's goblets, man. And they're what, all of a sudden a hand appears, and it starts writing on the plaster wall behind him. And it says the king watched the hand as it wrote and his face turned pale and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. So Belshazzar went, bruh. Uh, 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 but I wanted to title this Belshazzar goes, bruh. But, but uh, anyway, but imagine, imagine, listen, you're partying. You are like totally turned up or turned down. I don't know what young people, what's the right thing, you know, what you're supposed to do at a party, I'm old already, but you are there, whatever it is, you're there, right, and you're hey, exciting, you're having all this, and imagine now, you start seeing, and you, you think it's so cool, let's use God's goblets at like pimp cups, you know, and be like, whoa, <laughs> and you're dropping the henny in, the, in God's goblets, and you're toasting other gods with it. And, and, you're, and now imagine out of nowhere, you start to see the hand, you know, I mean, it's got to, something, you see a hand start to write some stuff on the wall there behind you. Now, I imagine, you know, you thought it was cool to use these goblets because in your mindset, the God of Israel is just another God. In your mindset, the God of Israel, who cares? If I don't believe in him, he can't do anything to me. And I think that captures the mindset of the world today. I think that's a pretty accurate mindset. If I don't believe in God, then I don't have to be accountable to him. How many of you heard that kind of thinking? If I don't, well, you know what? The Bible is written by man. If I don't, if I don't accept the Bible, then I don't have to read it, and then I don't have to be held accountable by it. And, and people like to go into the Word and they look for all kinds of discrepancies in the Scripture so that they can say, well, see, that was man written. I, I don't have to follow any of that. I just got to be good. I got to be a good person. I don't kill nobody. I don't rape anybody. And, and it's funny how we compare ourselves to the lowest forms, right? As long as I'm not killing and raping, then I'm a pretty good person. Isn't that a pretty low standard that we hold ourselves to? If I'm not killing and raping or doing mean things to children, I'm a pretty good person. And that's kind of the mindset of the world, you know? When, when everything around us declares the glory of God. 
I, I, I question people. I love when people come at me with stuff like that because I love to, to just kind of go back. I love to bring clarity to their hearts and to their minds, you know. And they're saying, but, but you know that John says this and Matthew says this. So if there's that discrepancy and so I don't have to believe any of the word, I don't know. I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. I don't know. But I know there's something, you know. Anybody talk, they talk like that, you know. There's something. I know there's something. And, and I just try to show them who something is, you know. And, and you know, even when all around us, the, the, the nature, everything declares the glory of God. Listen, those, if anybody in here, you're doubting, listen, trees, th- think of this picture in your mind. Trees bearing fruits that have seeds that grow trees. Plants, watch this, watch this. Plants that breathe in what we breathe out and breathe out what we need to breathe. You, are you telling me that could happen by accident? God, like evolution created photosynthesis. I'm giving you science class, come on. I learned this one thing in science and it changed my life. Plants produce oxygen and they take in carbon dioxide. We take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. We, together we exist and we work really well. Amen? That had to have happened from the beginning because if it didn't happen from the beginning, like the word says, then we would never have survived to evolve. Fascinating things. Beings, human beings, male and female with parts that connect and combine and reproduce. Oh, man. Isn't that amazing? I know you, you, you might think like this dirty to think like this, but, but that's amazing. That's amazing that we have male and female, that they connect and combine and, and, and childbirth. Oh, man. Understand that if that didn't work right from the beginning, how could anything survive to evolve? You can't, right? It can't because if, if, if the first male, the first female, and if that didn't work, there's no more males and females. So it has to work right out the box. You can argue with God, but there's everything in nature declares creative design. But here's one that bugs me out, baby teeth. That's, a, that, that, that's amazing. Baby teeth. Do you, can you imagine if we were born as babies with these size teeth? We, we, we look a little crazy. But creative design gives us little, little bitty teeth. And then there's a function somehow that we lose those teeth and grow more teeth. But it's not a process that evolved because otherwise every time we lose a teeth we grow another set of tooth. Which would be awesome, you know. <laughs> but that's not how it works. It was designed to fall out because we were too little. And, and when we got bigger to grow teeth that fit. That was creative design. Evolution doesn't care if we got little teeth, big teeth. Right? I mean, I mean you know, it's stuff like that that if you just think about. You want to argue with people about the word? Forget arguing about the word. Show me how God just does amazing things and then get to know that God and then when you know that God then start to read his word because it matters now amen so don't argue with people about scriptures those people just want to argue tell them explain baby teeth to me <laughs> oh, <callate. laughs> big bang I'm, I, come on man Everything about the creativeness that we are says that there's, a crea- that there's a creator. So, all right, back to the story. Come on. So there's a hand. You guys are distracting. So there's a hand that appears and it writes on the wall. Now, now the, 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 here's what happens. Verse 7, it says, The king called out for the enchanters and the astrologers and the diviners and the water mercados and, and his mother and his aunt and his cousin. Bring me everybody that's into that stuff. Because I need to know what the writing on the wall is. He's scared. Right? 
And, and he says, whoever reads the writing and tells me what it means, they're going to be clothed in purple, and that means royalty in that time, and they're going to have a gold chain placed around their neck. That doesn't mean they're going to be like a hip-hop rapper or nothing, but that time, a gold chain around their neck is, symbolized authority, right? Wow, that's an interesting connection. And that's another time. So, and, and he said he'll be made third, the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And so everybody came, all the interpreters, all the brujos, all the brujas, everybody came out, and they look at the writing, and they're terrified. They're baffled. They have no idea what it means. And they say to the king, we don't know. And so that's when the king, the queen comes and tells them about Daniel. He says, listen, there's, there's a man named Daniel, and God gives him clarity to, to un, undo riddles and to, 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 to bring illumination, and, and, and he's able to solve things like this, and God gives him light to be able to see things, right? And so, now, if, if we look at the story, surely this king has heard of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, the king before him, or two kings before him. Because these stories are passed down to the king. You know what happened to the king that was before you. You know the stories. You know his history. You know how you became king because of the way that kingship ended, right? So he knows this story. He had to have known what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He had to have read the stories that were passed down, right? And so he probably knows that Nebuchadnezzar had an experience just like, he, like this. So the God of Israel, in the end, and, and, and you know, in Nebuchadnezzar's story, at the end, he declares that the God of Israel, he's the real God. He is Lord of lords. He's king of kings. And, and so now his, he knows that his granddad, Nebuchadnezzar, had the same thing happen to him. That story is found in Daniel 4. Go back to Daniel 4 if you have your Bibles. Let's, really quickly, it goes like this. That king had a, tr- a dream about a huge tree. Nebuchadnezzar has this, this dream, this vision, and he sees this huge tree. And it reaches the skies, and its branches reach to the ends of the earth. And he sees, and there's fruit on it, and every animal is gathered to it, and everybody finds shelter and finds food in it. It's an amazing tree. I'm thinking of, like, tattooing that on my back. I think that would be really, really cool. But then the rest of the story, then you don't want to, all right, kill that tattoo idea. So (coughs) in this this message, he he sees this vision, this incredible tree, and then he says, a messenger comes, a holy, the holy one comes, And the messenger declares, cut it down. Cut down the tree, trim the branches, scatter the fruit, but leave the trunk intact. Leave its roots in the ground. And then the messenger says, listen, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth and let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdom. And so, like, like this guy's doing, every time the kings have a vision like that, they call all the Walter Mercado, they call all the astrologers, they call everybody to interpret. Nobody could interpret back then. Daniel came, and Daniel comes. Daniel says, God, give me clarity to interpret this dream for, for, for King Neb- Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel gets the interpretation, and Daniel tells him, King, I'm sorry to bring this news to you, but you are that tree. Can you imagine? He says, you are that tree. You've grown strong and powerful, and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. But you saw a messenger, a holy one, say, cut it down and destroy it, but leave the stump. Daniel 4, 24, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree that the Most High has issued against you, the Lord, my king. You will be driven away from people, and you will live with wild animals, and you'll eat grass like cattle, and you'll be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its root means that your kingdom can be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And so Daniel tells him, King, please take my advice. Turn, repent of any sin, and turn and do good. Daniel tells him. And so he has a chance. And so the word says 12 months later. So it's a full year later from that vision. It says King Nebuchadnezzar is walking on the roof of his kingdom. And he says, he's looking out over Babylon. And he says, look at this kingdom, which was built by me and for my glory. 
And the word says, while the, while the words were still on his lips, the decree came to pass. And he was driven from his people, and he had the mind of an animal. He ate grass like cattle. Listen, God gave his mind over to believe that he was an ox. And so he walked on all fours. It says he grew hair like feathers of an eagle. It says his nails got long like a bird. And he lived with the mind of an animal for seven seasons. That's seven years. And so people looked at him like this guy, you know, he had the mind of an animal. Can you, can you imagine that? And look at this, verse, verse 34. Seven seasons passed until the day that, verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is the king talking, I raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. And then I praised the most high God. And then I, I honored him, and I glorified him who lives forever. And at the same time, when my sanity was restored, my honor and my splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles, they sought me out, and I was restored to the throne, and I became even greater than before. Listen, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all of his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. Church, listen, I love this story because, because listen, it might seem harsh. It might seem harsh at first, but you still see the heart of God. You still see the love and grace and compassion of God. He gave God, he gave the king a dream. He gave him a warning. Listen, this is going to happen to you because you think you're too big. You think you're too powerful. You think you don't need God. A lot of us could be there right now. We think we got under control. We got enough money. We got enough money in the bank. We got a good job, whatever. We don't really need God. He says, you think this way, but, but, but I love this story because it gave him an opportunity. It gave him 12 months to reflect on the vision. How many of us have had years to reflect on what God has given us, to reflect and give God thanks for what he's given us, for what he's allowed us to, to have and to, to amass, right? But even after all of this time, when he blew it, how many of us blown it after we've given all the chances in the world? Even after all of this time, he blows it. And even after he blew it, he had to endure the seasons of living like an animal. And that might seem harsh, but he was just living like there's no God because that's what he believed. Even after such a strong and appointed and difficult season, there was an appointed end to that season. I've said this before. Somebody needs to hear that today. The end of your, your the hard season that you're in, listen, this is for two, three people in here. The hard season that you're in, there's an appointed time for the end of that. Receive that. That might, that might not be totally comforting and revealing, but, but I want to bring clarity to you. There's an appointed season for the end of that thing. And then he says, at the end, I love the picture that we see at the end. He says, when I worshipped, when I looked at heaven, my sanity was restored. When I worshipped and praised God, when I called out, my reason was restored. My presence of mind was restored. How many understand that when you worship, when you praise, when you, when you honor God, your honor is restored? I, I need somebody to get excited. He said, he said, listen, when I praised him and when I lifted him up, I was made greater than I was before. See, God's not trying to make you less. He's trying to make you more. God wants to make you more. He wants to give you more. We just have to understand that, that it's all from him. We have to understand that he is sovereign. Amen? Some of us can shout because we've been there. We've acted like animals. We've wasted seasons of our life acting like there's no God. Come on, somebody. Or like we don't, we, we don't matter to God or, or, or like the word, what the word says doesn't matter to us. It wasn't until he raised his eyes toward heaven that his reason was restored. It wasn't until he started lifting his hands in praise. In word. Where's my worship team? Come on. It wasn't until he started raising his eyes toward heaven. Some of you might be there right now. Listen, you, 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 you kind of go through the motions. You come to church, but you're living like, like God doesn't, doesn't really, like the way, what you do and the things that you don't matter to God. 
And God wants you to know that you matter today. God wants you to know that he's so involved in the intricacies of your life. He got you here safely today. God, God wants you to know that you matter. And, and so, listen, there's breakthrough when we worship. We, we learn from this picture that there's breakthrough. It wasn't until we lifted him up that we could be lifted up. That our senses can be returned. That our sanity can come back. It wasn't until you start praising the God of heaven that we can see clearly again. Let's start playing something. We're going to have to go into a party right now. So that's, that's the mindset I want you to have. It's not until you understand and start to say, listen, God... You are the God. You are sovereign. You are over. It's not until we lift our eyes to heaven. It's not until we start to praise him that we can see clearly again and we can be restored. Yes, yes. And we can be returned and we can be made greater. It's not until we acknowledge the God that walked with Adam, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It wasn't until we declared that Jesus was Lord of lords and King of kings, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. It wasn't until we praised him that our reason was returned to us. Our wrongs were made right. Our rough paths made straight. Our crooked places made, made straight. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs to look up and be restored today. I wanted to bring you this message from Daniel because it, it's not just my desire. I want to bring clarity. I want to solve problems. I want to be a dissolver of doubts. I want to be an interpreter of visions. I want light. I want understanding to be found in me. But that's not just for me. That's who we're called to be. Do, do you get that? That's who we're called to be. Each and every one of us are called to be that. That's when we practice his presence. When we make a practice of prayer, of fasting, of study, of showing commitment, committed to Christ, then we're preparing to be the Daniels to this generation. That means when something goes down at your job, you're the one that's going to come and say, no, no, I, I know somebody. I know somebody who's a dissolver of doubts. I know someone who can solve hard riddles. And that's when they'll bring you in on the scene. And this could be a multi-million dollar thing that's happening and they're bringing you on the scene to bring clarity. And you're the clerk. You're the admin. But the CEO is bringing you the admin. No, no, I know. Hold on, there's somebody out there that, that makes my copies. But he's got insight. She's got, she's got clarity. She's got wisdom. And, and, and she's able to make me understand things. Bring her in. Bring her in. Church, we got to be prepared to be called in when the world needs answers. Amen. And we got to be transparent so the world can see through us and see Him. Amen. Now, if you've been following the story today, I left you with the writing on the wall and I didn't explain that. How many of you caught that? How many of you kind of want to know what, what the writing on the wall was for Belshazzar and what it meant? Well, guess what? The challenge this week is study. I'll give you a secret. The answer to that one is found in Daniel chapter 5. But the... the the challenge this week is study. So you got to read the book of John, but you also got to find out what the writing on the wall meant for Belshazzar. Why Belshazzar went bruh. <laughs> Can we lift our eyes to heaven for a minute? Come on, let's stand. I'll give you another hint. It didn't go well for Belshazzar. It wasn't a good, it wasn't a good interpretation. 